And so I, I want to get started. We have an hour to go through um, this, and I, I'm hoping that you'll get uh, some tools out of it, some strategies uh, that I've found useful. A little bit on, on myself is um, when my wife and I go on vacation, she usually takes novels, like when we went to uh, the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, she takes novels and I take books on neuroscience or... Uh, <laughs> So I, this, I'm sort of a neuroscientist, um, not uh, formally, but out of interest. Uh, I used to teach science. Um, I used to be a school principal and do a lot of professional development. So this kind of idea, the ideas around this um, have always interested me. And so I've gathered a simple way, I think, of helping people when it comes to trainings. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is, um, move ahead on, on the workshop. So hopefully <clears throat> what you'll find is um, as, as you leave the session today, you'll gain some, some understanding of some of the strategies that, that are informed by neuroscience and also some of the psychological needs that tie into that because um, the strategies neuroscience really is also the mind as well as the brain, right? How it works. And, and so we're gonna tie those together. Um, and so what I've done is come up with <clears throat> five simple strategies, um, which spell water. Uh, and then we add a theory, uh, which is relates to motivation, which is called self-determination theory. All right, so the five training strategies, um, spell the word water. And um, the first one uh, I'd like to present is wow. Now, I like to sort of model what I'm doing, which is a little hard to do interactively. Uh, in person, when you're in a workshop, you can do things a little differently than in, on a webinar. Um, so we're gonna start with just a little wow. Um, see how this works. All right, well, <clears throat> what WOW is, and in this case, um, I showed you a clip from, from YouTube from Luke Bergeron, who, who has come up with, uh, you know, clips that he's taken from different places um, and, and shows, you know, people who have adrenaline going, who have um, their brain um, very engaged. Um, and whenever you engage the emotions, you're going to really get the save button going. In a workshop, you want the save button to happen throughout the workshop. Um, it's good to have it happen at the beginning, just to give people in their mind, oh, this is going to be a useful workshop. Um, so I, I even like to do things before the workshop starts. Um, I might, in, depending on if it's experiential workshop, which all my workshops tend to be interactive and experiential, but if it's about um, adventure ed, um, it'll be one way, but also if it's even motivational interviewing, I might, while people are just arriving, I might do, you know, this trick that you've probably seen and, and make it into a metaphor where the idea is to catch the ring. Not sure if I can do it, you have you see it, but it's like the, the idea is to engage and there to work, of course, um, but <laughs> the, usually the chain engages. <laughs> um, so you want to, you know, catch people's attention, that's wow. Um, so what does the save button do? It's basically uh, getting their emotions going uh, because your, your emotions are, are showing it as well. So you're doing some positive facial expressions, your posture, your eye contact, your level of enthusiasm. You're getting their, an emotional charge going. And so the limbic system is engaged. Um, we know that things like mirror neurons get the, there's mood contagion. Um, 
And there's the whole balanced neuro neurotransmitters, which, which really inform a lot of what's going on in the brain when, when we want to transfer short-term memory to longer-term memory. It's a lot about integrating thoughts in the hippocampus that, that are related in the, in the limbic emotional system where the amygdala plays a big role. So mirror neurons are going on with you, what, what you project, they project in their own mind. And you, it strengthens atten attentiveness. Uh, now, I'm, and there's a handout that, that goes with this, the slides of this webinar that you can access. And so I, I put some ideas of how, what things I do for WOWs. But remember, WOWs are used throughout uh, the workshop just to get some, some memory going because it engages the emotions. So the more emotions you can get, the better. And the other thing is I like to end as much as possible with a wow, because the last thing that people will remember from a workshop is that they will, they will think back in their mind. And the last thing that happened in the workshop is the first thing they're going to think. So if you want them to think positive things about your workshop uh, or your, your training, you, the last thing you do is important because that's the first thing their brain is going to remember when they think back. Hmm, I wonder how that, what, how was that workshop? They're going to think the last thing. So you want to end on a high wow, if you can, uh, at, some, at, some, at some level. At least it can't be sort of uh, fading the, away. So here's some ideas that I would do. Like uh, you see, for instance, you've done the game um, finger catch uh, before, probably where people put their finger in other people's palms. Uh, one that I like to do, um, even when it comes to doing workshops on the brain is this rope walk where it's a simple wow for people. It's like, I didn't think you could do that where people hold a webbing and walk around with a guide. Um, everyone, of course, leaning with, with their weight on it. Um, magic tricks can be metaphors. Um, you wanna be fast enough paced so you don't bore people. And then of course, trust activities. So won't get into too much, but neurotransmitters are what play a big role in this. Um, and, and so, as I mentioned, mirror neurons. The second one <clears throat> is the aha. The aha is basically people in their own brain going, hmm, yeah, I agree with what's going on here. Their, their brain is not questioning what you're saying um, as much as possible. And, and the best way to do that is for them to have an experience um, that helps them have that, that cognitive ease, that, that ability to think, you know what, this goes along with the way I think, you know, with, with, if it's about values or it doesn't threaten their sensibilities or their, their thoughts. And so experiences can do that for you. That's what the ahas are. And let me just talk a little bit about that. We use an experience before we make the label. If I start telling you what it is before I do an experience, then it's going to it's going to be, um, and I, in a way, I'm doing that. Uh, so let me let me click in right here, where I'm going to share just a quick, another quick um, um, video here. <clears throat> you might recognize Yoda, and we'll listen real quickly. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So I might show something like that. Um, when, when we're um, in the middle of a, a, of a session talking about fear. And so, you know, how, how do you deal with fear in your life? Um, so I have that little experience, which is just a clip. Uh, but then I'm trying to get people's memory going on how they deal with things. So that's an experience, even though it's, it's more a brain, a brain thing, thought thing. But you're trying to get people in their own brain about either through experiential ways <clears throat> or, or um, through clips or any other kind of thing. So what has helped you overcome fear in your life? So if I'm doing a workshop for young people, which a lot of my work is involved, I might want to you know, present something like the idea of name it to tame it. So that comes from neuroscience. And how, how, can you, how can you control your anger? How can you control jealousy? So. <clears throat> So what I might do is, is um, help people think about the, of the way their, their brain works when it comes to getting angry. 
And then in my other handout, I have this, the memory circle activity, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, but we use it particularly having people share in, in a circle, you know, um, the negatives, we start with negative thoughts where people just popcorn and have those ideas, but then we, we then have them go around and share what they could do differently um, when it comes to getting, naming their emotion, I'm getting angry, and instead, this is what I'm gonna do. And so with the memory circle, we go around, and that's explained in the other handouts, but that's sort of an idea of how, in this case, I'm, I'm presenting the, the um, aha for students would be around, you know, their emotion, strong emotion of anger, and then how to deal with it, which is name it, which brings it up to the prefrontal cortex, rather than staying in the emotional state where they could just continue to get enraged and lose it, right? So aha is really having an experience first, um, and it can either be interactive or like I mentioned, it could be even a clip or memories, but it really what it does, it facilitates cognitive ease. Now the idea of cognitive ease, um, I like from Daniel uh, Kahneman's book, Think Fast and Slow. And that whole idea is, is that really you want to not overtax the cognitive parts of the brain. And anytime you threaten people, um, you know, with their autonomy, with uh, threaten them where you're presenting things that you that they're starting to think, well, I don't know about this. You know, I don't know that I agree. Um, and so having an experience first to then write on helps facilitate the cognitive ease. Um, it facilitates meaning making, which is really what we know about in, process, in, in the whole uh, experiential processing that we do. Um, it makes associations possible, and then it, it does the neural integration of engaging the body cognitively and emotionally, um, and draws ideas from others when, as a facilitator, and this is a hard thing to do in, in a webinar, but the whole idea is to get ideas from the group rather than just be the one talking, and that makes webinars really difficult as a tool uh, when it comes to trying to do this, the experiential part, the aha. Um, <clears throat> so here Daniel uh, Kahneman says, um, you're might, more likely to learn something by finding surprises in your own behavior than hearing surprising, su <clears throat> surprises about people in general. And, and so you want people to relate it to their own life. Um, and so experiences help do that because they just had this experience, they felt whatever you did. So, and this, you know, this is where, you know, AEE and experiential education comes in and we're probably most everyone's familiar with the experiential learning cycle, um, you know, Kolb's experiential learning cycle, which, you know, is how we have the experience and then where we, we, we live the experience, reflect on it, we generalize and apply it, that whole process. Now, if you take a little neuroscience look at it, um, that um, what we have is, is that the co-constructed development teaching theory, which Schenk and Krishenk, I probably butchered their name, um, recently uh, had an article in AEE's Journal uh, of Experiential Education. Um, it shows you know, how taking into account neuroscience, how we can, we can adjust that, that whole circle, uh, experiential learning cycle. And, and some of the main points from that um, are, um, are the idea of framing the activity, framing it, having the activity, then direct debriefing, bridge building, which is an assimilation. Um, so, but it takes into account the whole idea of, of um, front, front end, front end, um, uh, it involves the non-conscious system of appraisal, but also the, so that's sort of the, re the reflexy part where you're just sort of going along with things in automatic pilot, but also the more energy demanding back end where people have to, to use le higher levels of consciousness. They're making and integrating their thoughts. Um, so neural growth is stimulated whenever you get the more de energy demanding front end involving the cortex, the front and the prefrontal cortex. So this back end of learning does not always happen spontaneous, and that's why as educators or as trainers, you're wanting to guide people through that process. And so that's what you're doing in a training. And so you're, you're trying to make it easy, at the same time challenge people to use that, that energy efficiently. 
and you want to do it without them thinking in their mind, I don't know if I agree with this. And then they're wasting their energy in the doubt mode. Um, <clears throat> so and the other, the last thing I wanted to bring up when it comes to experience, we know that processing is so important. Um, and so that whole idea of reflective listening, which is something motivational interviewing does, um, but helping people tell their story, uh, tell their thoughts, um, how does it fit into because when you're helping people think that way, when they're talking, they're using their left hemisphere um, of the brain, unless, of course, you're left-handed, that could be reversed and so forth. But um, so what you're trying to do is involve both sides in doing the neural integration. Because when they're telling their story, which is their, their mental life arises in the right side, their biographical memory about themselves is their right side. But when they talk it, they're having to, to to then bring it up to their left side. And so that integrates the thoughts and integrates. And in, in motivational interviewing, we find that that's really important in, in resolving ambivalence when it comes to change. But in, in general learning, that's what happens too, is you want people to, to go through the process of thinking and speaking what their story. So that was the aha, and, and I'm wanting to move along so we have enough time to get to all of these, but I think the aha part is probably one of the more important ones is to be experiential as much as possible. Um, then there's the threat free one, which really um, ties to, to the others. Uh, in some ways you, you want to have people see ahas without being in the cognitive ease part has to do with how threat free, threat free they feel. Um, so what is threat free workshop training look like? It basically, you're trying to counter this constant fear people have when they're in a new setting of um, not, am I going to be asked to do too much? Sometimes in experiential settings, that's, that's how people feel. People talk about, oh, I hate those, those icebreakers people do. So you want to, of course, we know how important challenge by cho the choice is. And so you always want to make it so they don't feel controlled. You always... Um, be careful when people are, um, have to mandatory are mandatory attendees, and then you have to then, you know, get into asking them to do something they don't want to do. So I always like to bring out challenge by choice because that's how you make them feel feel threat free. You you allow them to express their values and beliefs, um, increase increasing their their ability to make meaning. And you don't want them to like have oppositional stance going on in their mind. It's like, no, I don't agree with this. Uh, allow, <clears throat> and allows participants to be present in the moment. And, and again, facilitates cognitive ease because as soon as they feel threatened, then that makes it energy consumption is going on. And they're, and they're not with you because they're thinking, mm, I don't know if I agree with this. So the threat response, uh, limits neural integration. It allows different parts of the brain to be engaged simultaneously. Um, so when you have this threat, threat, threat free environment where people feel trust. Um, so you want to prevent feeling that way and you want to help encourage trust. They find that in even in school settings, students who don't who feel um, they don't have trust in, in the classroom or in the school can only learn you know, they say as much as half as much as students in, a, in an environment where people feel safe. And that tells us the value of, of what we, we do in an adventure uh, experiential education. So you've, you've seen the optimal challenge, the um, Vygotsky's um, zones of proximal development. I like to use this just even in a workshop is just to remind people it's challenged by choice and you probably have done ropes if you're, if you're an adventure ed person. You may have done the comfort zone, challenge zone, and danger zone. I like to use these uh, to remind people um, that they're really, they have the autonomy to decide what is their optimal challenge. And so I use, use this always at the beginning of an experiential workshop on adventure ed, but also I might do something like this um, or mention challenge by choice, uh, even in my motivational interviewing workshops or workshops on, on learning in the brain. So it's always the whole idea of people feeling like they're not being compelled, that they have agency and aren't being forced. So, however, we know that um, 
that when people feel optimally challenged, that's best. They, we don't, if it's too easy, if, it, if their emotions are not feeling challenged, then neural growth does not happen as well. So we want to give people experiences, and we know that in Adventure Ed, that, that really people grow a lot when they challenge themselves. Um, and so the whole idea that um, Louis Cosolino has is how important it is to have people you know, feel challenged and have moderate stress, but they feel like in control. There's a difference between not feeling in control and that's where you feel stressed, out of control stress, which is damaging to the brain, causes actually long-term damage if cortisol levels stay, stay there. But moderate stress, on the other hand, actually gets the hippocampus to actually transfer some of the short-term memory into long-term memory. So that's where where we want to give people just enough optimal stress and they're the best ones to know what is optimal for them or not. So that's where challenge by choice again comes in. I know that Carl Ranke uh, told me when I was writing my dissertation and interviewing him that the first semester that they started Project Adventure, they were telling students they had to do this and had to do that and the students hated it. Um, it wasn't until the second semester where they introduced challenge by choice and students then felt like they had a choice, that, that made all the difference for them to take the challenges that were being asked of them. And, and then they didn't complain about the class anymore. So what do you think? Um, do these sequential strategies so far make sense to you um, based on your experience as a, as a trainer, facilitator? Um, anyone wanna put any chat ideas up? Um, so far any thoughts like normally in a workshop i would maybe gather people into pairs or into little groups and have people talk because i've been talking 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 some of the ideas you might say mm, maybe some of them you might mm, i don't know about this or you might be oh okay so that opportunity for people to get out their opinions even in their small groups later on i might popcorn thoughts out you know, that's, that's something that I like to do to quell the whole idea of being, feeling, having people feel threatened uh, and also cognitive beats because now they're like, if they have doubts, they're, they're talking it out with, with their peers uh, or if it's a small enough group with the whole group. And, and so just getting it out actually, um, their opinion then gets them more willing to listen. So getting people's thoughts uh, without just telling them what they should think is important. Anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, so you're always, oh, I see some people talking about challenge by choice when working with groups on campus um, and they haven't used it in workshops, uh, conferences. You know, I like to, you know, always tell people because I get complaints sometimes, you know, usually in the abstract, not when, from my workshops because I, I tend to, oh, I hate icebreakers. Icebreakers are the worst, you know, and certain personalities just don't like icebreakers. And so before I even get started and I even do the finger catch or whatever activity, I like to start with, you decide the level of participation, right? So I, I, that gets to what we're gonna end with, which is the whole self-determination theory, uh, which I think these things make it happen. Um, so, so engaging in an exercise before jumping into the topic is, is, is really good. In fact, I used to be a science teacher and we did it opposite, right? Where we did the science experiments at the end instead of at the beginning. And what neuroscience tells us, no, do the science experiments at the beginning and learn from that rather than at the end to maybe prove what was, what was said was true. Um, so yeah, good, good ideas here. The ideas between experiencing in the exercise and what happens to them on the field or the court or whatever. Rich, we have a question here from Romy about asking for more examples of this aha moment. Can you can you maybe think of some of the workshops that you've delivered and how you like to really zero in on that moment for participants? Yeah. So, so in in the handout that that I gave you, um, you know, I have. I've, I've created this little handout and I'd be glad to share off, off you know, if people send me emails. Um, so 
depending on what the topic is, of course, is that's what the aha is going to be. Uh, because the aha is like, ah, oh, huh, hmm, yeah, I get that. You know, they have the experience and now it's easy. So for instance, when I do my motivational interviewing workshops, the way I start my workshop is um, I'll have them do trials, two trials. So we pair up from the very start. I might do finger catch just to talk about neural integration quickly because I think motivational interviewing is all about helping people integrate their thoughts so that they can resolve ambivalence. And so figure catch is, a, you know, double-sided. It's, it's a little bit, it's really, that is just to, to make it safe. And, you know, it's an icebreaker. But again, I've said it's challenge by choice. Then I might, the second thing I'm going to do is get them to feel what it feels like to have people honor autonomy. So motivational interviewing is all about helping people have autonomy if you're not familiar with it. It's all about a conversation. So I have two trials. One trial is, is not doing that. And so we take Thomas Gordon's, Dr. Gordon's ideas of what you should not do when it comes to threatening young people or people in general, uh, if you want to have a good conversation with them and things like give advice, uh, which, uh, or threaten people, tell them, you know, they should do something. So it's taking away their autonomy. Or then we do a taste of motivational interviewing, which basically is just a few questions about five questions where there's a little reflection in the middle where you tell them what they told you and you're basically evoking from them their solutions. So that's, they basically, they get to experience really what motivational interviewing is. From then on, even if people are told they have to be in this workshop, they've just felt one, either they felt that as the provider or as the recipient of somebody who had an issue that the other person was helping, because they've tried both ways. So that's an example in my, motivational interviewing workshops that I do but really it's all about the topic so your aha is all about the topic so in the handout that you're going to get um, you'll have some ideas um, and I'd be glad to share more so just in the interest of time I'll, I'll but thanks for the question then the the other thing that's the um, strategy that I think is important is this whole idea of being eclectic multimodal you don't want to just be, you know, didactic like I'm being right now, but you want to mix it up. And they say, you know, if you, um, if you look at, at, at the best workshops, the best trainings, people every 16 to 18 minutes um, will actually need to, you need to change it up. Um, and ideally, uh, you might even want to change it quicker. So you want to change modalities. So you might be interactive and then People talking on their own one-on-one, on one, their brains are active when they're doing cooperative work, where it's not just listening to someone talk. Um, so eclectic is really about changing it up. So every 15 to 20 minutes or sooner, you want to do something different. Like this is probably taxing you that I'm talking so much. And I wish I could do something interactively that we're all together. Because it, the brain... It can only handle so much, you know, being talked at. It's almost like, you know, if you're in another country and you're trying to focus on a language, it's not your first language, your brain gets tired and that whole cognitive ease thing is part of why you want to be eclectic. Um, so you want to change it up uh, from logical linear to abstract creative. Um, so it, the neural benefits are it prevents the cognitive overload that your brain is like, this is just too much for me to just take in right now. Um, the whole idea of what wires together fires together, um, which it's the HEB principle, um, the, the whole idea of, of how we integrate our thoughts. And so what we, you want people to fire creatively at the same time is, is logic linearly, which actually is con combining two sides of the brain. Um, and that kind of, that helps with with memory and with with uh, learning. So multimodal, multisensory experiences help wire pathways uh, learning memory. So here's um, here's some like examples I mentioned, like cooperative groups, um, paired activities, um, active, less active, um, personal reflections, um, didactic, short, cognitive, ease one. So you don't want to like talk at as much as I'm doing right now, but um, so that's the whole idea. Um, experiential learning, and that's where AEE 
you know, is really a gift to education is the whole idea of how important it is to make things experiential. Um, we spend too much time uh, having students prepare for tests and so then prepare for this and, and it, it doesn't help them to integrate their thoughts. And so it's just become rope, rope memory. And so the idea of doing things experientially is, is gonna be much better when it comes to their learning. The storytelling that we talked about earlier, clips, um, you know, using art, using music, um, and then the whole idea of giving them breaks. Um, now, when I work with young people in Chicago urban schools, and my work is, is often, because I, I do professional development for teachers and for counselors, but I also work directly with students where uh, I'm actually doing the motivational interviewing, but I'm, all, I'm doing the adventure together. And I will give them breaks, but some of the breaks I like to give is have them have water and fruit. Have, give them something that helps, helps their brain be attentive. Um, so I think that's, that's important. And then there's the last strategy, which, which this is good because it's gonna give us some time to, to have questions and answers and maybe even go through the other handouts I have, is to, to spend some time recalling, reviewing what is learned. Um, the brain, the more often you think about it, the wires get connected more and more. And so recalling, reflecting um, makes those connections um, more, more direct, more, it, re, it actually strengthens the pathway. So, so reviewing material, and if you can do this in an experiential way, so that you're reviewing at the same time as having fun in, in the way you review, then, then you're gonna get fun. And in a way, that's a, a good way to wow a workshop. And I might even do often in some of my workshops, I might uh, do the, the whole activity that many of you probably are familiar with, the uh, I like my friends, um, or the wind is blowing sometimes it's called. So that activity, basically you're sitting in a circle. It's sort of like there's somebody in the middle, they say something true about themselves. And of course, challenge by choice but the idea is you get up if it's true with for you yourself as well so they say something and then somebody is left in the middle and then I might have cards um, they have a question and that question is about the material we covered and they can choose at that point because I don't want to threaten them and put them on the spot is they can choose to either answer it if they feel like it or they can be the the asker of the questions to the group or they can go up to someone and say hey want to help me answer this so they have some choice but it makes it sort of fun um, as part of the part of the review but you want to re-engage the same multimodal pathways that have been that you've brought up during the workshop um, strengthen those pathways by reviewing it by recalling it um, so that you help fix the long-term memory because what's happening is your short-term memory and we can only keep about five thoughts, short-term memory thoughts, five to nine at most, um, in our brain at one time, which is why phone numbers are as short as they are. Um, we wanna keep those and then move them into longer-term memory. And that happens in the hippocampus, but it, it, it is strengthened when it's multimodal, when there's emotions involved, where there's the wows and the, and the ha's, and then there's no threat. So it enhances, the whole idea is enhancing neural integration. So you wanna review, recall, do something to do that. And so just remember that our short-term memory can only handle about five things at a time, most of us. Some people can handle nine chunks of information at a time. Um, it's, there's limited holding time that we can sort of keep thoughts in our brain. And so we, we don't wanna flood people with too much. The simple, the better, which is why I came up with five you know, strategies, water. Um, so water, <laughs> what are water strategies? Uh, let's review quickly. The W, uh, anybody want to chat on what W st stood for? Rich, while we're waiting for folks to type in some answers there, one, mm -hmm. one thing that I, that I thought of and, and wanted to get your opinion on is mm -hmm. um, around this, this T. I won't say what it stands for yet because I know we're yeah, going to do that, but uh, I, Sometimes when doing trainings about things I really want to make an impact with, uh, I've, you know, 
kind of like if you're teaching to drive a 15 passenger van, you might show a sort of blood on the highway type video about how, how things can go wrong with 15 passenger vans. If you want to uh, talk, talk about judgment and safety, you might have a story or, or an incident of something where something went horribly wrong. And I yeah. wonder if, if that, if you, your thoughts on whether that creates a threat that you don't want to be there, or if that creates more of an aha. Uh, or a wow, right? Because wow. they're ready yeah, to wow, because you're getting their emotions going. And in a way you want that because they're not in the, in that, you know, accident or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to feel like, I, I would call that a wow. Like for instance, in one of the, uh, I mean, if you want to see good, you know, some good presentation presentations, of course, not very interactive because they're just presentations you you know just go to ted talks and i heard of one um that the person is talking about uh, mosquito-borne diseases and he comes with a jar and he's like here are mosquitoes in here that i brought from from the tropics <laughs> and uh he's threatening to open them um so that's like definitely a wow um I don't think he opened them because I think that probably would have been too much. Although I think if he really wanted a big wow, he would have opened them, right? It's like, oh no. Um, so that might be threat. I think he would be crossing the line um, and moving. So that would move it into the threat mode. Um, so I would say he should keep that jar closed, but say I could. <laughs> and that so would make it a wow. It's a threat. If it's a threat to your participant, Right. Maybe not a great idea, but if it's a threat to someone else and your participant should know about it. Yeah, because you're trying to get them emotionally charged about, you know, and I think that's so important. You know, you want to, when you're training people, you know, how important it is. I mean, safety is the number one thing we train about in adventure, right? Is, and that, that focus prevents, you know, accidents from happening. You pair people up before you go swimming. You do this and do that, right? And, and, um, so those kind of things, you know, I think are, are important. So those, I would call that a wow. And I don't think it was a threat. What do other people think? When, when leading high ropes training, I always start with um, taking the trainees through the course. Definitely, right? Facilitating a meaningful experience and then talking about it throughout the training seems to be incredibly effective. And then Brad talks about um, anything that is kinesthetic, right? So anything that's physical, since I primarily work with uh, athletes, yeah. So Ubuntu cards, yeah, those, re those processing are very cool to get people engaged and moving around. Another study I've used lately is using quotes from famous athletes, yeah. So that's, that's you know, good aha ways of, of tying it into the topic that you're, you're dealing with. And then T, well, did I miss anyone else? But uh, if there's T, uh, what would that be? Again, anyone just to make this interactive <laughs> on a webinar. P stands for the review. Definitely, thanks. But uh, yes, threat free. So, or trust. It could be even trust because that's what we're really trying to do is have people feel safe and trust. So threat free. And and to be honest with you, the easiest way I find to be trust threat free is to actually create opportunities for experiential opportunities to show that the environment is threat free. So, you know, I, I'll do um, the finger trust walk, one of my favorites in a workshop, uh, even in the motivational interviewing ones, because I, I find that, that it, it, even if it's not, you know, about experiential education or about how you can just do some one minute things that changes people's paradigm about how safe they feel in the setting that they're in. So like the trust activities, like, the finger trust walk, um, where people pair up and walk themselves around, but they promise to keep each other safe first. Um, so again, I have examples like that in, in the handout. Um, that's what you wanna do when you, when you have conversations with people, like motivational interviewing, or when you're doing workshops, is you wanna make sure that you're not gonna, they're not gonna feel like lapped at. Um, they're gonna feel like totally trusting if they open their mouth, if they, um, if they disagree with you. Um, you know, so threat free. Uh, anybody else? How do you create a threat free environment in your workshops, in your educational settings? Any thoughts? 
I like the the rope walking on the rope activity one because in a way that's a wow, but it's also getting at trust. You know, it's helping people say that everyone in the group here is going to keep one person safe. Um, so yeah, the full value contract um, or the five finger contract that we use with young people, which is you know similar. Um, Brad says that um, I asked the group what expect what they expect um, want of me as a trainer or how they learn best, and I capture those characteristics on a flip chart, and, and that is our informal contract to the in, in environment and how they want to learn. So you're asking them, and and we're going to tie this right into to the that's a good lead. Um, to what we're going to talk about next uh, after we get to the E and the R is how we honor that, you know, that whole idea of people's autonomy and competence and um, making it safe, relating it. So T, unless there's anybody else who wants to how, write how you keep create threat-free environments, a lot of it is the way, the way of you the, the way you act and the way you um, accept um, people in, in the way you uh, present. So you honor people that might even disagree, just like you don't agree. And you reflect back what they said instead of disagreeing with them. Um, sometimes just so you're feeling this way about this. Your, your idea is that you're not sure that this is, you know, this is true for you. Instead of you arguing with them, which then becomes a threat, threatening environment. You can just tell them back what they told you, um, without, you know, getting on their case. So I like that idea of, of reflective listening that I borrow from motivational interviewing. So uh, here, Dan is saying that he agrees, right? Asking them what they, they need and expect from me early on. So you're giving them what what they want. Then the blindfold activities um, that. Um, that my, my Z says, I hope I, I pronounce your name again. Um, blindfold activities, um, you know, are really good. I like to use those in my adventure courses um, and then put them through a tunnel. Uh, again, right before I put them through the tunnel, um, I might actually, I tell people what they're gonna do and give them the choice again um, for, for doing that. So why don't we move on to the eclectic? Oh, I gave you the word. So what does that mean, eclectic? What, what's another way of saying that? Uh, instead of eclectic, another way of saying it that's more commonly used is, is uh, what? Multi, yeah, multimodal, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, the whole idea is changing it up. Let's not overload the brain. Let's get more parts of the brain working. Let's connect the, the, um, the, the, the different, what fires together, wires together. Um, so the, down the Hebb's principle going so that we have more for, more for the brain to use when it comes to recollection or uh, cementing that learning. And so you don't overtax the cognitive, cognitive part of the brain and make, make it easier. And then the R1, which is what we're doing right now, of course, is, is reflection. So refle re recalling. Re, re, uh, reliving, reviewing. So, so let me just uh, um, quickly move right into the theory of self-determination because the whole idea is, is we're doing these strategies and they fit into a mind thing. Uh, the, the brain, the anatomy functions in certain ways. Um, and it's the mind that uses, creates the, it's the energy, it's the activity. So the mind is the product of the activity that occurs in the brain at, at a molecular um, level, a cellular and atomical level, which are impacted by a personal, person's interpersonal, sorry, um, cultural context and societal experiences. And so what, we're, what we wanna do is the societal, uh, the social part, interpersonal relationships are very important in the way the mind works. We're a social creature. And that's where I think self-determination theory helps to inform the way I like to do um, workshops and relate to people. Um, you're probably familiar with self-determination theory. Um, um, 
Ryan and Desi uh, came up with this, um, you know, barring from, from other theories and so forth. But they basically say that all cultures, all ages have three basic psychological needs for healthy growth, development, and motivation. And that is autonomy, competence, and relatedness. If I were going to present this, for instance, um, with, a, with an aha, I would, I would say pair up. Uh, and before I even would gotten to self-determination theory, I'd have said, pair up with your partner, decide who's person number one and who's person number two. And then person number one, close your fist. Person number two, uh, try to get person number one to open their fist. Um, the, the only thing you can do is talk to them. You can't, you can't uh, coerce them. You can't pr promise them bribes. You can only use your, your power of conversation. And, and that would be an aha for self-determination theory, the whole idea of autonomy. Because invariably, and I only let this happen for a minute at most, um, invariably, you know, people are like, no, I'm not opening my fist. It's my fist. You can't get me to open them. And people are trying to convince people to open their fist and they want to own their, their behavior. So autonomy is sort of, we all need it. We all need to feel. As much as we copy each other, <laughs> we want to feel like we control our behavior and our decisions and our thoughts. Um, the next one that we all feel that is to be recognized for our competence. We all need to feel like like um, we have the capacity to manage the affairs of life um, to in our work. We all need to feel competent um, and that we're effective. We can get things done. We, you know, people respect us for, for our ability to train or whatever. Um, so competence is the other one. And then the last one is relatedness, which is, you know, the whole idea of belonging and caring. And that's where we use, you know, adventure ad a lot for, for group building, team building, community building, it's all about helping people feel related. Um, you know, today's society, schools, groups, we, we, we use social media, but we don't, and that maybe in some ways helps to create relatedness, but it's a distant thing. And so being in person sometimes makes all the difference. So I think self-determination, if understanding self-determination can inform how we do a workshop. And I think what what the water does is help to honor autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that's where I wanted to, in the last um, six minutes or so, what I thought we, we might want to do is, is look at, at these and look at, at um, and then open up for questions. We could, we could quickly um, just look at the, the, the water, the WAP water and look at wow and aha uh -huh, threat three and effective and think real quickly um which strategy uh helps meet autonomy for instance okay threat free yeah because if you if you don't honor autonomy right away people people feel threatened it's like you're telling me i have to do this now you know that's not i don't want to do that and then they get more stuck is more like adamant about no you're threatening my autonomy? No way, Jose. <laughs> so yeah, very good. So that's a good one. Anybody else think that maybe any of the others might be honoring autonomy? I think I ha, yeah. So Brad says that that um, challenge by choice idea is is really which could apply to water. The what what weight? if you were to ask them to choose to participate. So that's, that's definitely the whole autonomy thing. And I think AHA sort of acknowledges people's competence, that we honor them to make connections, to have an experience in process, um, learn from the experience. We're honoring you know, their ability to, to process the experience and to learn from it um, and to show in a peer setting that they can do that. Um, so experiential stuff is very much, I think, about uh, competence. At the same time, in the process, we're helping them create relatedness. The whole, you know, threat-free environment that we're we're doing with adventure is going to be threat-free. So the more we can do our workshops that are that help to create that safety. Um, how about 
relatedness then? Anybody, which one do you think touches on relatedness? Yeah, so all group and paired activities, it you know, honors people's competence. Um, and you're also eclectically mixing it up uh, in the process, right? So you're really honoring people's ability to, to function, to, to work together, to you're expecting that and you do it and the people are feeling good and that they're honored for their competence. Um, and you're giving them the choice, right? Um, how they have the level of optimal challenge. And then the whole relatedness thing can easily be, you know, the threat free environment that we want to create. So those are, that's basically um, what I was thinking we could cover today, this whole idea of watering self-determination. And um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, I have a extensive bi bibliography there for you, um, but I also I'm more than willing to take any emails. We're almost at three o'clock, four o'clock, um, some people's time, three o'clock, other people's maybe. Um, so we're almost at the end of, of the time. But if there's any questions, I'm willing to stay on and answer questions. Those of you who have to move on and leave, um, feel free to email me. You have my contact information. You'll have that um, from the slides. So it is that time. Um, and so, but stay on if you want to ask me questions uh, on the chat and, and maybe ask the group questions because I don't claim to be like the only um, expert here. So anybody, questions? Rich, while folks are typing in their questions, um, I did uh, want to one, thank you for, for being here presenting this information. You know, we've, uh, we've offered this webinar to our upcoming presenters um, at the AEE conference. And I'm curious if, if I'm a presenter and I'm thinking about this information and I'm gonna do a workshop on something or other, what are maybe like the two or three things I should make sure not to do? So I, I think the, the group might um, help answer this, but one is the whole idea of making it safe, right? From the very start, uh, you want to make it safe. Um, and that's where laughter comes in. That's where, you know, um, in fact, making it safe can be a wow, right? Because like doing finger catch, you know, an activity is, is one that makes it safe because it's like, oh, let's we just laugh together. And that's like, oh, people's level of stress now being in this new environment. Um, so I would say making it safe and the eclectic is really important is like change it up. You know, don't be talking, you know, <laughs> of course, like I'm doing, um, <laughs> but don't be talking. Here's some ideas here. So Brad says, so any books, articles, or material, materials that would be most helpful to providing different methods for applying water? Um, yeah, so I, I've got that, the bibliography. I can point out ones, you know, um, that, that I think I could recommend. I can do this back channel then or on emails. Uh, here's, here's my email information. But I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you a list of ones that I think if you're going to choose a few, what would be the most useful because I've condensed these from, from multiple sources. Um, and you know, TED Talks are good things to look about. And there's even a TED Talk on pre presenting and um, that was, that's valuable. Um, Camille, and I can't remember right now, but it's, it's in my handouts here. Send me um, any questions anyone might have and good luck in your presentations and your workshops. Uh, hopefully you've taken just a little something. If you want people to think good about your workshop, um, you know, be as experiential and do sort of wows. Um, get that, that save button going. Um, the last thing remember that you do is, is uh, what they're gonna remember. So at the end, I like to do something I do in my motivational interviewing workshops, I do music, I put music on, and then we try to find in the words of the music, um, change talk, that's, that's sort of one of the things we look at. So that's the way I end workshop, uh, the first workshop that I do. Anyhow, 
We're out of time, but I'm willing to answer any other questions for those who can stay on. And just to remind folks that are out there, uh, we will be sending out uh, a PDF of these slides and the additional handouts and bibliography uh, that he's referring to in this webinar uh, shortly uh, after it's over, so in just a few minutes. And once again, just want to take a moment, uh, Richard, the, the, you know, the, the scaffolding I feel like you provide here for a lot of experiential educators, I think we do the stuff that we know works because we know it works or because we've seen it works. Uh, but we don't necessarily know why it works or what's going on inside of our participants that's, that's really helping to, to shape the changes that are made. So this really, uh, for me, provides that, that more thorough understanding of what it is that we're doing in experiential education and how we can be a little more precise uh, and, and we're still learning, right? And the neuroscience is, is so new. So we're, we're still learning. And even the whole idea of epigenetics, right? And how, you know, how we pass on some of our sensitivity, sensibilities from one generation to the other. It's like, wow, you know, our brains and minds are, are actually affected by our parents' experiences. If they went through trauma, actually it affects the way our brain is wired. So some of those things, you know, it's like, we're just learning, you know, it's real fascinating. Indeed. I guess we'll have to save that topic for the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Mizey for, yeah, what you, what you guys are doing in experientially is, is this is why it works, right? So keep it up. <laughs>